I still think Bitcoin can probably do, you know, it could probably do 300% or so this year and, and ETH could do more, significantly more again. I, I have added a bit to Ethereum and I'll add more. I haven't yet. I will broaden out and do some more stuff. I'm trying to decide what to look at. I'm probably looking at some of the beaten down DeFi tokens and some other areas of the market that have been kind of beaten down because this we've had this kind of big sloppy sideways range now for months and months and months and months and months. But some of the some of the markets been killed within that. So I'm starting to look at that stuff. Haven't yet deployed any money to it, but but getting there. But I have been buying ETH. And you have say fifty thousand dollars to allocate. What would you look at allocating right now based on the previous trends that we have seen uh, and where we're looking to head moving forward? So I look at it in terms of network effects, where w what networks are growing within crypto. So Ethereum's the, the kind of biggest, most robust network in terms of the number of developers, the number of people investing in it. So that makes that one of your base you know, investments. Bitcoin being the OG in the space is another base investment. But then you want to start probably going a little bit further out on the risk curve. So we're seeing these layer ones, um, stuff like Terra, um, Avalanche, and um, probably Solana. Interesting. Then I think maybe 2022 is going to be the year of interoperability. So we're looking at, you know, Polygon, Quant, and a few other things that might give us those opportunities. And DeFi has been quiet now for a year and a half. So I think we might see the next wave of DeFi along with NFTs and social tokens. So there's a lot to play for still this year, a lot, lots happening. What are you expecting from Ethereum price from this? Um, and also the, the Ethereum price structure building up to ETH 2.0? So, you know, it, it's the, the structure leading up is I don't know because there's a bunch of things going on, which is the network's been slow because retail investors have had their earnings crimped by inflation. So they've had less marginal money to be able to put in. There's the Fed tightening, central banks tightening. So there's a lot going on in this picture right now, which is why these prices have been wide ranging and sideways. Usually these big events are a turning point one way or the other. So if you went into it at a high in ETH, much like we went into the ETF or we went into the Coinbase listing, Coinbase listing was the absolute high to the day. Because what you did with the Coinbase listing is you gave people another alternative. So before they were forced into opening Bitcoin accounts, then they didn't have to. So they bought the equity and you lost billions of tens of billions of dollars of demand. So it depends what happens to ETH 2.0 and where it is, because if the prices are high, then all of the people who've been staking are likely to take profits when they can unstake. Now, when they unlock that stake, everybody else in the market knows that there'll be a seller. So you'll force them out at a lower price. It's just how markets work. If we go in at a low, then it's going to be like the Bitcoin halving, where suddenly this triple halving event happens and the price just recovers automatically because so much ETH is burned. So I don't really know. You know, I was expecting ETH to have been stronger into the back end of the year. And so therefore, I was expecting this whole thing to be at a high. I just don't know yet. But you did buy some more ETH. I did. In January, in 20, oh, yeah, I'm, so. still, I'm still bullet. I mean, I haven't sold a single thing. I've done nothing but buy for 18 months and I haven't sold a single thing. 18 months, yeah, 20 months now. And I think what's interesting as well, staking has played a huge element in this. And also the NFT metaverse boom, for my side, almost gives this kind of cushioning and support to two vulnerable Ethereum prices. Is that kind of the case from your side? Well, so, so if you think about it, what makes a network really robust is not only investors in it, i.e. token holders, but when people are developing on it, and then you're developing other projects on it that also have investors on top, you're creating network effects. So if you think of ETH in those terms, so there's now demand for the network, which is why ETH is so expensive, gas fees are so expensive, because everybody wants to use ETH. Okay. And then you've got the other phenomena where those expensive gas fees are going to burning ETH. So what you're doing is taking ETH out of supply as well. And that's, I think, the key reason why ETH was up 450% last year and Bitcoin was up 60%. It's to do with the robustness of the network and that burning of tokens <clears throat> and the fact that Bitcoin doesn't have Ethereum, uh, doesn't have NFTs, doesn't have smart contracts. It doesn't have any of this on it. It's got the lightning layer, but the lightning layer, basically what it does is batches a bunch of transactions on one blockchain slot. So you're actually not using 
vast amounts of the network. So I think that's why Bitcoin um, Ethereum did so well versus Bitcoin last year. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. One thing now that I do really want to ask you about is, we've covered Ethereum, the likes of Solana, the likes of Avalanche, the likes of Cardano. This year, what's your expectations for these? Because we've talked about Ethereum and what you're expecting. What about these other solutions? They've been moving fast because of Ethereum's expensive or slow versus some of the use cases. And so those have seen network effects as people have come away from using Ethereum. So it's a replacement trade. It's not new money coming into this. So it's just been basically a rotation. When everybody's looking at the rotation to continue, because everyone's now figured out, oh yeah, these layer ones, that's what we need. They don't work anymore. So it moves to the next thing. And whether that's interoperability, whether it's you know beating up DeFi because nobody's interested in DeFi anymore, I don't know. All I do know is that when everybody's looking at something, it doesn't happen. Is there any predictions for 2022 in the industry that you have that might be uh, something that we've not covered yet that you're expecting to see or hoping to see? I think that and I've been alluding this for some time because it's stuff that I'm working on that I can't really talk about, but I think this is the year of social tokens. People don't really yet, I talk about it, people don't really get it. We're seeing Bored Ape start with the Ape token. There's some of these, but these are still small scale. We're going to see some gigantic communities tokenize and we'll see the power of, of token economics. So that's the big thing that people aren't aware of because they haven't seen it yet. Um, so that's my big prediction for this year. In terms of price, I don't know. I kind of I kind of got it right and wrong last year. I said Ethereum was going to be the big trade and that did really well. Uh, I did think Bitcoin would end up much higher than 100,000. I thought it was close to 150,000 and it stopped at 69,000 wherever we got to. And um, so I don't know if I'm qualified to make them a pr prediction, but I still, I'm, I stick with, you know, I use the logarithmic channel and the upside for Bitcoin, if we get traction again, particularly if we get, end up with some central bank easing, which I think we will get uh, the last part of the year or allusion to it. I still think Bitcoin can probably do, you know, it could probably do 300% or so this year and, and ETH could do more, significantly more again. It's really interesting. I think a lot of people are going to be thrilled at that prediction as well. Is it? it seems like a very... Yeah, but happen. you know, you have to discount the fact that I didn't get it right last year. I mean, I got it right because I, you know, I made a lot of money from it, but I didn't get it right in terms of price prediction. Price predictions are impossible because, you know, the texture of markets changes over the year and you need to understand what that means. I mean, I'm not in this for the short term, so I don't really care, which is so... Um, but all I care about is the adoption and stuff like that. So... Yeah, it's tricky to make predictions, but we'll see. Well, look, it did a whole sideways, right? So it's it's right now it's about zero, zero returns over a 12 month time horizon. So we've just had basically a bear market, so a whole sideways year. Normally after that, you tend to get a larger parabolic rise. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them. And if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange. And one of the biggest are, for example, Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well-established exchanges. But, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. 
They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.